As a sophomore at Columbia Union College in Maryland, a young Leonard Bailey learned that his future in medicine may be in doubt when he met Walter Clark, the Dean of Admissions at Loma Linda University School of Medicine. He was an amazing, no-nonsense character who, after reviewing my college performance, said, Bailey, if you're serious about becoming a doctor, here's what you'll do. And he spelled it out in no uncertain terms. My conversation with that Loma Linda Dean was transformative. And from that day forward, I became a serious and a high-performing pre-medical student. Nevertheless, when I first applied to the Loma Linda Medical School, I was denied entry. I remember the profound disappointment. But I knew that I had some catching up to do, and I did exactly that. Plus, Nancy, my wife, and I began our relationship that year. And so for us, God had a better plan. The next year I was accepted, and somehow I just knew that I had found the place that I was destined to be. During Dr. Bailey's second year at the School of Medicine, Dr. Lewis Smith performed the first successful kidney transplant at Loma Linda. That success gave Dr. Bailey ideas for his future. Soon, he found a home in cardiothoracic surgery, and after completing a fellowship at the Toronto Hospital for Sick Children, he came back to Loma Linda, determined to help infants with fatal heart disease. Certainly up until the early 1980s, none of these babies survived. None of them. After years of research and cross-species transplantation, Dr. Bailey and his team were ready to try and save the life of a child. A time came when a baby entered the hospital that became known as Baby Faith, ultimately. And my options that were, were given to me were, you can leave her here and let her die, you can take her to Barstow Hospital and let her die, or you can take her home and let her die. And together, we agreed that maybe Baby Faye, instead of dying, uh, which is what all babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome did in those days, uh, that perhaps uh, baby Faye could be saved uh, with this experimental technology of cross-species transplantation. On October 26, 1984, baby Faye's broken heart was transplanted. Although she only lived for 21 more days, she was the beginning of successful infant heart transplantation. It took several years for me to actually realize that she was the one who opened the door for this to take place. And I wish she could have been born down the road, but somebody at some point in time had to be first. The medical community says this is a breakthrough. And so Lynn became in demand to lecture, to speak at societies, at medical conferences and so on, to help teach the technique of infant heart transplantation. And that has literally changed the face of transplantation around the world, moving even beyond hearts to saying there are ways to save the lives of these tiniest among us. The impact of Dr. Bailey's operation on baby Fay is that he taught us and he taught the world that nothing's impossible. That persistent pursuit for the right answer of a difficult problem is our responsibility. Dr. Bailey would become one of the leading authorities on congenital heart surgery and go on to perform 376 infant heart transplants. Each time we do a heart transplant, and then to see that heart take its first uh, sort of gangbusters contraction, uh, is, uh, that's truly the miracle of heart transplantation. That's where the miracle finally occurs, right there. And the reason I say a miracle is because we have no control. What Dr. Bailey never lost was the emotional impact of saving a child's life and that impact on that child's parents and others. The passion and the caring together with professional expertise is a unique combination among health professionals that, that Len displayed so very well. Dr. Bailey's influence spread well beyond the walls of the hospital in Loma Linda. Traveling with the overseas heart surgery team, he taught surgeons around the globe new techniques and impacted the lives of countless patients. While at home, he inspired medical students and the next generation of doctors. Uh, it's you know amazing. Anytime you can spend any time with a, a person that's that's literally done everything, seen everything, but has you know 
remained kind of humble and and kept everything in perspective. It's 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 great, you know, if you're across the table from him operating on something that you've only seen once or twice, he's probably seen it 50 times, 100 times. Yeah, it was amazing. I wish I I wish I had more time with him. Everyone saw Dr. Bailey the same. This was a gentle man. This man was calm. This man was passionate. This man was persistent in perfection. This man is what we all want to grow up to be. In many ways, I sense my own life was a bit of a perfect storm. And Loma Linda's evolution in life was a perfect storm. Many of these elements had to kind of come together to create pediatric heart transplantation. As a generation of infant heart transplant recipients grow up, graduate college, and have children of their own, we know that it took an incredible team to achieve these feats, but it all started with one man willing to put his big idea into action, a big idea that would change the world. On behalf of Loma Linda University Health, on behalf of Loma Linda University Church, and especially on behalf of the family of Dr. Leonard Bailey, it's a sacred privilege for me to welcome you to this service that celebrates the life and mourns the passing of a truly special person. Some lives are measured by their length, some by their accomplishments, some by their fame, some by the way in which their lives touched and improved the lives of others. It's rare that you have a life that is measured in most all of those categories. But I would suggest to you that such was the life of Dr. Leonard Bailey. We are drawn here this afternoon because he touched our lives, each one of us, in different ways. Some of you were his patients. Some of you were his colleagues in science and medicine. Some of you worked with him in the OR, in transplantation. Some of you called him friend, broke bread together, enjoyed life. Some called him dad or granddad. But the truth is that each and every one of our lives has been touched in some way by Dr. Leonard Bailey, and that's what brings us here this afternoon. Dr. Bailey was a man, in my view, of paradox. On the one hand, a renowned surgeon, but on the other, a truly gentle person. On the one hand, a man with many reasons to be proud and yet characterized by humility, known around the world and yet valued his privacy. I just happened to fall into conversation just about 24 hours ago in another state with someone who worked with Dr. Bailey, for a period of time in the OR, one of many, no doubt, Giselle Handel Schultz, who said this to me, I was always a bit starstruck around him in the operating room, but he was always incredibly kind and a true gentleman. Dr. Bailey was a man of humility and grace. And despite all of his other accomplishments, it is in particular those two qualities, for those two qualities, that it truly is my privilege to welcome you to this service that honors him. I met uh, Lenny Almost uh, 60 years ago now, we were at Columbia Union College together, struggling with pre-med requirements, 
And even in those days, he was focused. If you were to ask him, Len, what do you plan for yourself in medicine? I'm going to be a heart surgeon. Most of us came to med school kind of with everything on the table, and as we went through rotations, we kicked things off, but not Len. From day one, he was a heart surgeon. We went uh, to med school together. We were cadaver mates. Even in those days, his dissection skill was phenomenal. It was quite apparent that he had talent. It became more apparent as time went on that he also had dedication. And he always had that humility that we admired in him. I think if you had to describe Len in one word, you'd have to use the word enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, wonder, joy. Yes, he had things outside of medicine. Boat trips to the Channel Islands, after work, nighttime skiing up at Snow Valley, gathering around the Bailey kitchen and watching him light up those two big ovens and make pizzas for everybody. That was Dr. Bailey. We're going to miss his guidance and we're going to miss his friendship. Shall we pray? Our Father, we gather here this afternoon to celebrate the life of our colleague, of our mentor, of our physician in many cases, certainly of our father and of our friend. Today, we ask for your comfort. Today, we ask for the courage to, con to continue the pursuit of excellence that was his mainstay. Today, we ask for a renewal a renewal of that enthusiasm, a renewal of that wonder, a renewal of that sheer joy that can only be obtained in the service of others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
The world recognizes him as the father of infant heart transplantation. And many surgical societies honored him with prestigious awards. But for Leonard Bailey, he was most proud of his association with Loma Linda University and its medical community. He called this institution our soul mother in Christ-centered healthcare. His distinguished service as a physician and surgeon for five decades brought him great joy and was always driven by his deep passion to make life better for children with heart disease. As a trailblazing surgical giant, he was the amalgamation of a creative scientific mind, a curious and inquisitive spirit, and a kind, compassionate heart with dark determination and relentless optimism. For the last 30 plus years, I worked along his side. He was always the first surgeon to show up in the operating room. Six feet tall, with an enthusiastic smile, ready to make a difference. It was the height of every fellow's day to be in the operating room with Dr. Bailey no matter what side of the table he stood at. He made complex operations look simple, effortless, and fun. A piece of cake, as he often said. Truly a master surgeon for all seasons, except for his obsession with betadine. He used the antimicrobial betadine to treat everything outside the skin, inside the skin. And to honor him, we use betadine in our daily operations, except we now call it Baileydine. <laughs> One of his self deprecating humor-filled stories, when he was invited to the Vatican, he was so nervous meeting the Pope, he greeted him saying, Father Holy. <laughs> and during those long all-night operations, he would always speak of his family. He loved 
his children dearly. He would play the music you heard earlier, the music of Bocelli, Brightman, and Sinatra. Music that connected him with his wife, with his late wife, Nancy, whom he adored and often referred to her as the queen, the real crown jewel of his life. You may say he was a dreamer. As a gentleman professional, he was known for his signature note cards with handwritten uplifting messages of appreciation and encouragement that he shared with everyone, unit clerks, housekeeping personnel, fellows, fellows spouses, colleagues, patients. Not only did he have a gift for words, he meant every word. And his message to the cardiac surgery team in the pediatrics hospital in the ICU was, you are unequaled, signed LB. A few years back, one winter night, the weather would not allow him to fly in time from Loma Linda to Atlanta, Georgia for a donor heart. A local surgeon in Atlanta did the procurement and sent the donor heart to Dr. Bailey to implant here at Loma Linda. Two days later, that surgeon's wife, and the surgeon told me this story personally, that surgeon's wife in Atlanta received a bouquet of roses with a note that read, thank you for sharing your husband with us. Signed, Len Bailey. He constantly cheered on the team. And today, we salute him for showing us the path. And we say, thank you, Dr. Bailey, for the difference you made in our lives. And thank you to his family who lived the experience with him and supported him in his commitment to humanity. For there are children climbing the mountains in Nepal, running on the Nile River banks in Egypt, flying the zip lines in Nicaragua, and yes, playing music in Japan, the children in the Inland Empire and all over the globe, living life, they also want to say, thank you, Dr. Bailey, for making it possible. And Dr. Bailey's contributions and pioneering innovations will remain the pulse that will keep his heart circulating hope for generations to come. A favorite quote of Dr. Bailey's, Dr. Wagner, you mentioned his enthusiasm, a favorite quote of his is one by Winston Churchill. Success is the ability to go from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Perhaps this reflected his life story. He had few setbacks and many triumphs. Number one, his first application to Loma Linda University School of Medicine was rejected. He reapplied, and a year later, he was accepted. Lucky LLB and lucky LLU. Baby Faye died unexpectedly three weeks after his daring pioneering xenotransplant. One year later, Dr. Bailey performed the first successful newborn-to-newborn -newborn heart transplant, 
baby Moses. Alive 33 years later on his same graft, and the rest is history. At the peak of his youth, Dr. Bailey faced the diagnosis of metastatic cancer. He suffered through treatment, and six months later, returned with renewed enthusiasm to a full regular surgical practice for yet another 16 years. And when the radiation treatments to his head and neck dried up his saliva, he rigged up an artificial salivary gland system that he kept near the operating room table where he stood. A water bottle hung on an IV pole connected to a small silastic tube that micro-dripped water into his dry mouth and kept him comfortable during those long reconstructive heart operations he routinely performed. Call it the grit, perseverance, courage, resilience, dedication, it is all of the above. And recently, during his last long, valiant battle, when cancer took away his breath, his sparkling eyes would reflect a message of peace as he wrote on a pad, I do not regret a thing. I would do it all over again. In his commencement address entitled Passing the Test of Time, delivered at the 2002 School of Medicine graduation, Dr. Bailey challenged the Loma Linda graduates with a piece of Native American wisdom. Here it is. When you were born, you cried, and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a manner that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. How blessed we are today to celebrate such an extraordinary life. Yet it is fitting for the world to cry. It is fitting for this community to grieve for the loss is huge and the void is deep. As we remember, a humble healer, an indelible mentor, a proud father, a loving grandfather, a courageous human being, and an incomparable friend. We love him with all our hearts we will miss him severely. Nineteen seventy-five. I was a first year surgery resident on the cardiac surgery service where Lynn Bailey and John Jacobson, two of the best doctors I've ever known our fellows. On the first day, I learned that Lynn Bailey's premature gray hair belied his age of 33. On the second day, I quickly learned that Lynn's wisdom, his skill and poise also belied his young age. Today, we will have heard many things about Dr. Bailey. A specific story, however, may be the most effective and memorable way to portray who Lynn really was. You see, Dr. Brett Quave, a School of Medicine graduate in 1999, who practices anesthesiology in Medford, Oregon, submitted a personal account of Dr. Bailey. Brett's story will be published in the soon-to-be-released morning devotional entitled Grand Rounds. Brett's story reads as follows. As a junior medical student, on a busy cardiothoracic surgery rotation, I had the opportunity to participate in a surgery to correct a ventricular septal defect in a seven-year-old girl. 
The cardiac surgery fellow and myself carefully opened her little chest to expose her heart. I admit that I felt somewhat starstruck as Dr. Bailey, a Loma Linda icon, entered the operating room. After introducing myself to him, he invited me to stand next to him. During the procedure, we listened to a beautiful male operatic voice singing an enchanted melody. I asked Dr. Bailey, to whom were we listening? He said it was Pacelli, a blind Italian opera singer. I explained how I loved music since both of my parents were professional jazz musicians in the city of New Orleans. I told Dr. Bailey my father had recently sent me a video of a Bocelli concert. Dr. Bailey asked if I had watched it yet. When I told him, not yet, Dr. Bailey emphatically stated, son, when your dad takes the time to send you a video, you need to watch it. <laughs> As we continued the surgery in our conversation, he turned to the circulating nurse and said, Get Brett's dad on the phone. <laughs> As we continued the surgery in our conversation, he turned to the circulating nurse and said, have you gotten hold of uh, Brett's dad? The nurse looked a little confused, but proceeded to carry out the order. The phone cord was stretched across the large operating room, and the nurse held the phone to my ear. Unfortunately, there was no answer, but I did leave a message for my father. Dad. You'll never believe where I am right now. I'm in the operating room with Dr. Leonard Bailey. I just wanted to let you know I'll be watching that Bocelli video tonight. I love you. The nurse hung up the phone, and Dr. Bailey and I continued our conversation as the surgery was flawlessly completed. A year and a half flew by, and I was a finally an official graduate of the School of Medicine. The commencement ceremony was ending, and our professors and attending physicians marched out while the beautiful recessional played. A distinguished-looking tall figure donned an academic regalia, paused his step, and glanced at me, simply nodding and smiling as he marched by. It was Dr. Bailey, and I felt honored, but a bit startled that he remember and acknowledged me. The next day, my father approached me as he was preparing for his long drive back to New Orleans. Son, I have a little gift for you. It was nicely wrapped and obviously a CD. I removed the paper and was excited to see it was a Bocelli CD. Dad, would you please sign and date the cover? Already taken care of, my father said with a smile. I opened it, but the handwriting was one with which Brett, remember relationships are the most important thing in life. Live well. Signed, Lynn Bailey. I was stunned and continued to be deeply moved by this simple message shared almost 20 years ago. How did this come about? Well, after receiving the message on the answering machine, my father contacted Dr. Bailey, and they conspired with the help of Dr. Bailey's secretary and my wife, Jody, to coordinate signing the gift that would impact my life forever. I thank God for mentors like Dr. Bailey and my father who take time to make a difference. And in Hebrews 13:7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Good afternoon. I grew up a military brat. My father was in the United States Air Force, and um, in 1984, I was finishing my freshman year of high school in a little town called Mascuda, Illinois. It was yearbook day, and in our yearbooks every year, there was a section that showed the year's biggest events in the news. And I remember seeing a picture of Dr. Bailey and baby Faye that year as he performed the first infant heart transplant using the heart of a baboon. So fast forward to June 3rd of 2007, when after eight years of struggling to become pregnant, my husband and I met a teenage couple from Colorado who flew to Loma Linda to give birth to a little girl and place her for adoption. That little girl was missing half of her heart. We knew that she would probably need a transplant, and that is a very big risk to take, of course, 
and there's no guarantees that she will live. We left the birth parents in the lobby of the main hospital that Sunday night. We went home and we prayed about what we were about to do. And on Monday, we received word that Dr. Leonard Bailey wanted to take this little girl's case. We retained an emergency or an attorney and began an emergency adoption of our daughter, and she was born that Thursday. After two weeks in the NICU, Peyton received her life saving open heart surgery, and without needing a donor heart, Dr. Bailey said, I can fix this. I remember the morning of her open heart surgery and meeting Dr. Bailey in person for the first time. The lights were dimmed in the NICU as it always is because it was pretty much the middle of the night and we were touching our daughter and all the wires all over her body and feeling the anxiety of that surgery that was to happen two hours later. And we looked to our left and it was like this halo of light uh, surrounded this tall silver haired gentleman who walked through the, the door and he reached out his hand and then there was this sense of peace. He was here, the man from my yearbook. The man who I knew would save this baby who I had prayed my whole life for. It was Dr. Bailey, and he became our family that day. My daughter Peyton, she called him Dr. Belly, because she couldn't really say it very well. Um, she is now 12 and thriving. And I've had the honor and privilege over the last 12 years to work many events, speak at many events with Dr. Bailey. Uh, he was humble, he was soft-spoken, genuine. He hated when I would make a big deal about him. He was very, very humble, he didn't care. To me, this was a man who changed lives. He rescued children. He fixed hearts the size of walnuts. Let me tell you what else he did. He ran himself to the nurse's station and grabbed me some formula when I didn't bring enough to the hospital during Peyton's first checkup, and I was a new mom, and I had four days noticed, notice, and I was more concerned about um, traveling to her appointment with this oxygen tank and her feeding tube and everything, and that another follow-up appointment, one of her stitches was poking out of her incision and wasn't dissolving like it was supposed to, and I was freaking out, and he stopped me and he said, well, that stitch is going to take a little bit longer to come out. I put in a little bit extra cleavage for Peyton for when she's older. And then he winked. <laughs> and you know what else he did? He held my hand at the station one day when he came in to record with BBC Radio, and he needed to use our studios. I'm privileged to work at KFROG. I had just lost my brother uh, in his sleep at 45 years old, and I would walk around with this immense grief and my brother's autopsy report in my purse. I didn't understand why God took my brother. And Dr. Bailey, took a look at the autopsy report. My brother passed away in Illinois, and I figured, well, you know, Dr. Bailey knows everything. He'll know what happened. I just needed to know why. And Dr. Bailey said, no, it was quick, it was peaceful, and it was beautiful, I promise you. And we prayed together. He was my friend. I have said this before, that there have been only two people in this world who have held my daughter's heart in their hands, our Heavenly Father and Dr. Bailey. I am a mother because of Dr. Bailey. Thousands of children are alive because of Dr. Bailey. And I have to remind myself, as hard as it is, that we have to praise the God that gives and the God that takes away. Dr. Bailey is here in all of us, and his legacy remains in the children whose lives he saved. He had a gift, and he was a gift. And now if you'll turn your attention to the screens to meet some more amazing families whose lives were blessed by the gift that is Len Bailey. My name is Maria Aguirre, and this is Eddie Anguiano, mm -hmm. also known as Baby Moses. He was Dr. Bailey's first infant to infant heart transplant. Dr. Bailey was a great man. His determination, his courage, to fix the babies that had broken hearts was remarkable. Mm -hmm. he, um, he was a very silent gentleman, spoke very softly. He would walk into the room and I had fear of everything. And I remember he would just say, we'll get through this. Well, um, he was very patient, very kind. 
and uh, explained everything very, very well to me. Um, he was just a very courageous man. Was. Right? I... Um, he was our hero. He saved Eddie's life. Remember you told me, where's Dr. Bailey? He'll always be where? In the hearts. That's right. Yeah. If, if, if it wasn't for him, then, and, and, and then I, I, would not, I, I would not even be, be healed. That's right. But you're here. 33 years. years. With his heart transplant. Yep. So we're very grateful to Dr. Bailey and all that he's done for us. We'll always yep. be grateful. Always. We are a Skarsega family. We met uh, Dr. Bailey about 17 years ago when uh, he did the transplant in Gael. And also we met him again uh, 10 years ago when he did the, uh, the transplant to our son David too. And uh, our memories of Dr. Bailey is always uh, peacefully. He always talked to us, explained the things to us. He always asked to pray for him before the, the surgeries because uh, he did a uh, few surgeries on David. For us, he's always been uh, our hero. And also, I think it's gonna be our hero for uh, many families could uh, give us uh, the second opportunity. Dr. Bailey is a hero to many families, to many people, I'm sure of that. And he has inspired me to become a biomedical engineer. I want to design a artificial heart to help people like how he did. Uh, Dr. Bailey was somebody, a very respectful, honorable person that, that I want to be at least, at least close to him, I don't know, something. It's amazing what he did over the years, saved many lives and I really want to thank him for what he did for our family and my two little brothers. And I just want to say thank you for everything and rest in peace. Yeah, and he always gonna be in our hearts and our memories. And uh, I'm so thankful for the family he let us uh, the opportunity to have. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like for you now to meet some of the families and the children who have all been touched by Dr. Bailey, if they could stand. This is his legacy, and what a beautiful legacy it was, and it is. Troubles come and my heart burden be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand. strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. Strong when I am on your shoulders, you raise me up 
to more than I can be. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulder. Me up to more than I can be. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. shoulders you raise me up to more than I can be you raise me up to more than I can be This afternoon, we honor the life and legacy of Dr. Leonard Lee Bailey, a brilliant, gentle, caring, kind, humble, loving man who is devoted to his faith, family, friends, patients, and his profession. Leonard Lee Bailey was the husband of his beloved Nancy, the brother of Joan, Donald, and Nelson, the father of Connor and Brooks, the father-in-law of Crystal, and the grandfather of Olivia and Everly. His work was as a surgeon. His patience was mending broken hearts. He was a lifesaver. Len's destiny began taking shape the moment he was born on August 28, 1942, in the Washington Adventist Hospital in Tacoma Park, Maryland, to parents Catherine and Nelson Bailey. Len would be the third of four children of the couple, his mother, Catherine, was a registered nurse who worked the night shift at the Washington Adventist Sanitarium for over 30 years. She would return home in the morning to get her children off to school and then care for her invalid mother. Catherine dearly loved her family as well as her patients, and it was his mother's demonstrations of caring love that would draw Len to medical work. His father, Nelson, was a soft-spoken man he was just 16 years old when he left home to seek a job as a cook at the Washington Adventist Sanitarium and Hospital. He worked there for 20 years, eventually becoming the lead head chef, and was to later run the food service department at the Review and Herald offices for 30 years. An intuitive chef who never used recipes, his meals and pizzas were famously delicious, causing fans to line up early on their favorite menu days. His maternal parents, Elizabeth and Grant, lived in western Ohio, where he would spend several summers of his childhood. Lenny Lee, as he was then known, greatly admired his grandfather's kindness and relaxed manner. Len's paternal grandmother, Anita Bailey, possessed tremendous energy and capacity for hard work, which she passed down to her son, Nelson, 
and through him to Len. During his elementary years, Len attended John Nevins Andrews School in Tacoma Park, where his best friend was Billy Woods. The two of them were resourceful, mischievous, and shared most of their waking hours together. It was during this time when Len met two doctors who made a lasting impression on him and drew him to the profession. Billy introduced Len to his uncle, Paul Woods, a general practitioner who was a kind, gentle, hardworking physician. Willie Eastman practiced general surgery and was a sponsor of the Capital Boys Club, participating in camping and fishing trips and playing baseball with the boys every summer. Len and his friends were a few of the generation of boys inspired by Dr. Eastman. It was Drs. Woods and Eastman who Len would later praise as being examples of the ideal physician. In order to stay in church school, Len took his first job at age 13 to help his parents who had little money to spare. He began working in the sanitarium kitchen, collecting dirty trays, placing them on the conveyor system, and down a dumbwaiter shaft to the dishwashing crew below. After two years, Len met with the personnel manager at the Review and Herald offices and convinced them to hire him as experienced kitchen help, making 30 cents more an hour than at the sanitarium. Len would later call himself a late bloomer. In high school, he was more interested in cars than classes, tinkering with his 1950 Ford and drag racing on the local streets. He thought about becoming an architect, but a teacher discouraged him. At age 17, Len went to work for an Adventist businessman named Frederick Schneider, who owned a construction company. Len installed insulation, hung siding, shingled roofs, and worked sheet metal for four years, putting himself through most of college. It was while he attended Columbia Union College that the idea of becoming a doctor appealed to him. He applied to medical school, but months later received a thin envelope, a rejection letter. Still, he was determined to become a doctor, and possibly a surgeon. The extra year it would take before finally earning acceptance to medical school, he would later say was a blessing. It gave him more time to further refine his study habits while taking night classes at the National Institutes of Health and to work as a medical technologist. He also had more time to get to know and court the beautiful and vibrant college freshman, Nancy Schroeder. It was on a Friday evening in 1964 that the Loma Linda University International Heart Team visited the college following their first trip to Pakistan, part of a national tour by doctors Ellsworth Wareham and Joan Coggan to present their groundbreaking work overseas. Len sat spellbound through the duo's presentation, and from that moment on, he knew he wanted to be a heart surgeon. He received the thick envelope of acceptance from Loma Linda University Medical School in 1965. He also felt the time was right to take his relationship with Nancy to the next step. He wasn't entirely sure where she stood on the matter, feeling she seemed elusive at times. He tried a hypothetical proposal. What do you think you would say if I asked you to marry me, he said. <laughs> And she responded, why don't you ask me and find out? <laughs> they became engaged. Len arrived here in Loma Linda in the late summer of 1965. Mr. Schneider, the construction company owner, had paid for Len's trip and his first semester expenses with a check for $2,000. For the next year, Len and Nancy lived on letters and phone calls. Len would save every quarter he could find throughout the week. Then on Friday nights, he would go down to a gas station on the corner of Anderson Street and Redlands Boulevard and use a payphone to call Nancy back east. They would talk until he ran out of quarters. <laughs> During his freshman year in medical school, vascular surgeon Lewis Smith presented a lecture in the physiology course. Len was overly impressed with him and quickly asked for a job in the professor's research lab. His enthusiasm was met with Dr. Smith's guidance to slow down a bit. It was in their junior year when both Len and his friend from Maryland, Bob Wagner, 
landed jobs together in the lab. The two set up a project transplanting hearts from dog to dog, inspired by the South African surgeon Christian Bernard, who had just conducted the world's first human heart transplant. At first, they only removed the donor hearts for Dr. Wareham. But soon, with the help of Jerry O'Brien, a technician for the heart team, they completed transplants themselves. They even came up with a new way of better preserving harvested hearts, which landed them their first journal article, published in Archives of Surgery. When Len and Bob were busy in the basement with canine cardiac surgery, Nancy arrived on the human heart surgery service of the medical center upstairs. Nancy and Len had married, and she had transferred to Loma Linda to finish her last two years of nursing school. She was once assigned a four-year-old patient who was scheduled to undergo heart surgery the next day. She asked Len to come up and examine him. He was such a cute little guy, Len later remembered, but the situation didn't look good. Indeed, the child died in surgery the next day, and Len never really got over it. The event further focused his long-term goal, pediatric heart surgery. He earned a surgery residency at Loma Linda and occasionally accompanied the international heart team on trips, even joining the delegation to visit the Oval Office of the White House with President Richard Nixon. While Len was in Greece with the international heart team, Dr. Wareham arranged for Len to serve an elective year of pediatric heart surgery with Dr. William Mustard at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. The challenge was he had to get there right away. Upon his, his arrival back from Greece, Len and Nancy quickly packed up their Oldsmobile with everything they could fit in the car, and then Len strapped the ironing board on top. <laughs> it would be an ironing board, but it would also serve as a dining table and a study desk, too. They drove practically nonstop for three days to get there in time. The next year was a difficult, if exciting, time for Len, greater responsibility in surgeries, some of them still experimental back then, yet still watching many children die, sometimes on the operating table. Len mentioned during a Monday morning teaching conference that he thought their infant patients with hypoplastic left heart syndrome needed a transplant. Everyone stared at him in silence. A transplant had never been performed on a newborn. They hadn't even been successful in older children. To his colleagues, this idea seemed absurd, but for Len, this moment cemented his interest in pediatric heart transplants. During another conference, Len made a compelling presentation to use his invention of a titanium star to correct a defect in a main heart vessel. His colleagues agreed, and the case gave him his seventh published article. In July of 1975, Len and Nancy moved back to Loma Linda for the second year of his cardiothoracic fellowship. By the spring of 1976, Loma Linda asked Len to stay on staff in cardiothoracic surgery. It meant he could have a good clinical practice combined with a research department. Len began conducting infant surgeries similar to what he had done in Toronto, but he worried that the post-care team had little experience with such young patients. So he would often move into the patient's room and sleep in a reclining chair for several days, insisting on watching the baby himself following surgery. Len would rebuild the research department's resources and practice conducting heart transplants on infant goats. He worked tirelessly perfecting the difficult technique of operating on a walnut-sized organ and to develop a non-immunosuppressed control group he was steadfast about saving the beautiful babies with hypoplastic left hearts with transplantation. Dr. Wareham later said that Len at the time was consumed with an unusual idea, but had the technical skill to make infant heart transplants work. With two careers in the field of medicine, Len and Nancy still managed to invest time into their many dear friendships, family activities, travel, and helping others. Nancy orchestrated everything. Yet the greatest joy of all was in 1981 when Len and Nancy became parents to Brooks and Connor, completing their family and fulfilling their dream of becoming parents. 
With two boys, their home was always in motion. New traditions evolved with friends and their growing families. The Baileys, Wagners, and the O'Briens would spend many Thanksgivings and Christmas, Christmases together. With his woodworking skills, Len made an extension for the dining room table so everyone could sit together for the holiday meal. He set the table with elaborate decorations and was known for making beautiful wreaths for the front door. Christmas was his favorite holiday of all. He loved setting up the decorations around the house and meticulously wrapping all of the gifts. Friendships with these friends and their families and many others over the years would be a source of strength and support, no matter how harrowing things would get at work in the years to come. In 1983, Len had performed almost 200 animal heart transplants. The surgical aspect was perfected. However, the immunology data needed outside review. It was at this time that immunologist Sandra Nelson Canarella began to work with Len, initially as a consultant, but she quickly agreed to be on call as the immunologist for the case, if and when a transplant was actually performed. In 1984, Len met Teresa Beauclair, a 24-year-old living in Barstow. Her newborn daughter, Stephanie, had hypoplastic left heart syndrome and had been transferred to Loma Linda. Like every child in history with that condition, she was meant to die within a few days. That's when Teresa said she was open to an experimental procedure. Len and Teresa talked extensively about the option and all of its possible ramifications. Teresa agreed. So on October 26th, Len and his team, including Dr. Wareham and immunologist Sandra Nelson Canarella, worked to perform a heart transplant on Stephanie Fay with a donor heart from a baboon. The Washington Post last month referred to it as one of the most ambitious undertakings in surgical history. The procedure thrust Len into the spotlight of the international news media for weeks, creating one of the biggest news stories of 1984. Len regularly spoke at press conferences held in Randall Amphitheater, packed with reporters and television crews. The story is unforgettable. Stephanie, known to the world as Baby Faye, lived for 21 more days. While her death took a toll on Len, especially the media storm and medical controversy, her life encouraged hope and the beginning of infant heart transplantation. In 1985, Len and his team conducted the first successful infant heart transplant for Eddie Anguiano, known as Baby Moses. Today, he is the longest surviving individual to receive a new heart as a newborn. The Department of, Cardiothora excuse me, the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery would expand, and the number of infant heart transplant surgeries would increase. Many colleagues became an integral part of this historic time and some are still involved in Len's legacy of work today. In the medical community, Len became known as a successful transplant surgeon, going on to transplant hearts into 376 infants. He helped to develop new methods for repairing hearts, previously thought to be Baron repair. He became a renowned consultant to cardiothoracic surgeons around the world. Len remained the humble pioneer Recognizing the efforts of his colleagues, the supportive leadership, and thanking every individual involved along the way. He was known for the thoughtful handwritten notes he would send to patients, colleagues, friends, and his family, expressing his gratitude and encouragement. Often Brooks and his dad would go to lunch and spend time together. A loving handwritten note would follow. Len developed and demonstrated the qualities he admired most of those early physician mentors. His relaxed, attentive, and gentle presence made everyone feel calm. And it was no surprise to see him crawl under a table to comfort a scared child and perform an exam, or quietly appear in a hospital room to comfort a friend, or stay up all night answering questions for the parents of a child. He was the ideal physician. There were numerous offers for books and movies about his work, but Len declined them all, 
to prevent taking more time away from his family and caring for his patients. However, Len respectfully shared often in guest lectures and with other cardiac surgeons the heroic story of baby Faye and her parents and the successes of pediatric heart transplants to follow as a result of baby Faye's courageous fight. It was in the early 90s when Dr. Leonard Bailey invited heart surgeons from around the world to attend two separate Loma Linda University international conferences. He shared his discoveries, management, experience, and protocols for infant heart transplantation, encouraging others to implement these life-saving procedures. He was a genuine scientist and innovator who earned immense respect for sharing his knowledge. In 1993, Len traveled to Texas at the invitation of one of the most renowned heart surgeons in the world, Denton Cooley, to attend a barbecue for some of the international all-stars of heart surgery. The many attendees, including Dr. Cooley, Michael DeBakey, and the South African Christian Bernard, three of the heart surgeons Len highly regarded. For hours, the legends visited, sharing stories, and ideas. During his 42-year career at Loma Linda University, Len's leadership, both as a professor and surgeon, were evident in the positions he held, the most recent being Distinguished Professor of Surgery since 2005, Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics since 2009, Surgeon-in-Chief of the Loma Linda University's Children's Hospital since 2007. He was also Chairman, Department of Surgery for 15 years, and Chief, Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery for five years. He received numerous awards and honors, Alumnus of the Year from Loma Linda University School of Medicine, Lifetime Service Award from Loma Linda University School of Medicine, Michael DeBakey Achievement Award, David J. Dugan Distinguished Service Award from the Western Thoracic Surgical Association, and multiple other awards. With his extensive list of research hours, thousands of surgeries, patient care, 293 published articles, 14 international heart team trips, and over 330 lectures, it is understandable that Len worked long hours. Yet God blessed him with a source of energy to match his ambition in work to his love for and involvement with his family, friends, and his hobbies. It was an open-door policy at the Baileys. Friends were always welcome at any hour, and Nancy and Len managed to remain connected to a vast group of friends, even with their full calendar. There was always time for a round of competitive ping-pong, gathering for a spontaneous dinner, playing board games, backgammon, enjoying the Redlands Bicycle Classic, or gathering for the 4th of July. Visiting with friends was a priority. So much so that in March of this year, just a day after both Len and Nancy were discharged from the hospital, they attended their 50th class reunion of the Loma Linda University class of 1969 and had a wonderful evening seeing longtime friends. When work and family intersected, Len and Nancy would take the boys along. Brooks and Connor joined their parents on nearly a dozen of the international heart team trips all over Asia and Europe. In South Korea, they got to wear green scrubs and pose for a picture, which the family used that year as their Christmas card. Brooks recalls how he and Connor were the certified water purifiers, making sure the heart team had plenty of purified water every day. It kept them busy and undoubtedly included a lesson. Len was a master at teaching them a lesson in everything they did. Len loved the outdoors, snow skiing, hiking, camping, biking, boogie boarding, windsurfing, gardening, golfing. He jumped in and did it. He loved to invite friends over and make pizzas. He would eagerly go to air shows and took the boys up to Edwards Air Force Base more than once to see the shuttle land. 
He dreamed of owning a 1960 Corvette, attending car shows and auctions. Len enjoyed listening to music and loved playing the guitar. He loved any project requiring a trip to Home Depot and was known to just go look around. It was his favorite place to shop. He would play catch in the yard with Brooks and Connor and the family dog, and he cheered the boys on when they played softball. Excuse me, spud ball. He honored the uniqueness of both of his sons. Brooks, who loves to have fun, is business-minded and driven, has many friends, and like his father, enjoys cars. Connor, who is a deep thinker and writer, interested in history and politics, and like his father, is a huge fan of the Washington Redskins. Len took each of his boys on a trip, just the two of them, for father and son time. In 2004, he took Connor to the Middle East. The next year, he took Brooks to the British Isles and Spain. In 2013, Len and Nancy lovingly welcomed Crystal to the family when she married Brooks. The Bailey family continued to blossom with girls as granddaughters Olivia and Everly arrived. Thrilled to have little ones around, Nancy and Len were ecstatic grandparents, called Grandma and Pa. Len called the girls Sugar Baby. The greatest love of all in Len's life was his adored and cherished Nancy. He first met her when she was five years old. Len would describe her as the center of his universe. Each morning, he would show his caring love for Nancy by picking a rose from the garden and placing it in a vase on the kitchen counter next to a small handwritten love note. Both with a calm nature, energy to spare, and a capacity to love completely, Len and Nancy encouraged and supported each other in every way for 53 years, especially in the tough times. Planned by God, it was a blessing for Nancy and Len to depart this earth only five weeks apart, but especially hard for their family and all of us who cherished them. Dr. Leonard Bailey, you were a gift to mankind an extraordinary man who changed our world with your vision, passion, kindness, and care. In remembrance of you, may each of us lift up and encourage someone every day and share our love abundantly in everything we do. Rest in peace knowing you have taught us well. The year was 1984. I was in my final year of Master of Divinity Studies from Andrews University Theological Seminary in Michigan. I had come to California to do a chaplain, chaplain residency program. It was in October of that year as I was walking the hallways of the medical center that I noticed that a guard had been set up outside of, I believe it was, Unit 7100. A nurse manager, we called them head nurses back then, that I knew seemed to always be in the know, and so I went to her and asked, what's up with the guard? She hemmed and hawed, and then hawed and hemmed and wouldn't answer, other than to say that something big was about to happen. Unbeknownst to me, the names Baby Faye and Leonard Bailey were about to be cast into the limelight of the world's stage. It was an amazing time in Loma Linda. It was a time in which so much seemed possible and we had no idea of all the good things yet to come. It was my privilege in years after that to make Dr. Bailey's acquaintance and to have conversations together. I came to deeply appreciate him 
for all the qualities that have already been stated. Let me share just three simple memories with you. The first one took place here in this sanctuary. It was 2011. We were in the midst of a series of sermons entitled, The Best Thing You Can Do. The purpose was to look at different relationships and situations in our lives and figure out what kind of biblical wisdom might point us in the direction of the best thing we could do to improve and strengthen that relationship. We did things like the best thing you can do for your boyfriend or girlfriend, the best thing you can do for your spouse. And then there was one entitled, The Best Thing You Can Do for Your Heart. The purpose was to look into our own souls, into our own hearts, figure out what scripture might suggest about living the inner life. Well, as part of these sermon series, we had a dramatic element in the service entitled, A View from the Pew. The purpose was to zero in on someone in the pew, church member, friend, for a brief dramatic conversation that would set up the sermon. Marion Wagner did a superlative job, time after time, at writing the script, directing the drama. And I asked her, as we were planning that service, what could we do for the best thing you can do for your heart? She thought about it only a moment. She said, I have just the person may take some convincing, but I think I can get him to do it. So, well, that sounds great. I want you to look at the screen and see what happened that day. Hmm, okay. The best thing you can do for your heart. You think the pastor's going to be talking about the heart in my chest or the heart I wear on my sleeve? <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know, but I have spent so much time this week, especially after looking at the pastor's post on the internet, and I think that maybe it could be about the spiritual or the emotional heart, you know, such as, let's say, I say, Giselle, I really like being your friend because you have a really good heart, you know, that kind of heart. Yeah, but what does that mean, Missy, that I have a really good heart? Well, you know, you're kind, you're sensitive, you always do the right things. Yeah, but what do you think makes me want to do those things? I mean, they were just saying that if you really want to know where someone's heart is, you just have to see where they spend their money. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what they're saying. Oh, yeah. So, what? do you want to know where your heart is this morning? Uh, maybe. All right, then hand it over. What? Your checkbook. Let's oh, no. take a look. I want to see where your heart is. Take 10 oh. seconds. Simple little test. Okay. Oh, come on. All right. Let's take a look. Okay. Check one, two, three, four, five, six. Missy, according to this, your heart belongs to Nordstrom. Oh. No, 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 no. Come on. That was only one day. It's in black and white. No, no, no. Flip, flip a little bit more. Just okay, a few okay, more. Okay, okay. I have a really good, a really generous heart, really. Okay. University, church, building fund, building fund. Are you looking for them to name a room after you? A chair oh. or something? <laughs> oh, wow. No, not exactly. But you know what? That was nothing compared to what my grandma did. I mean, and I'm not even talking about money. I mean, my grandma, she did everything to care for the people in this church. You know, you're so right. I remember her, and her heart really was in the right place. She was so generous with her time and money. Her heart was just so big, she never met a stranger. There's so many times I wish I could take her heart and just transplant it into mine. You know oh, what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Excuse me, excuse me, girls. <laughs> I can't help but be impressed with how much you know <laughs> about the human heart. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a nurse, so I know a lot about the heart. <laughs> if there's anything, I mean, I'm just saying. You're so flattering. If there's anything you want to know about the heart, you can just ask me. Thank you. Oh, and no don't problem. forget, oh, I have spent seven whole days this whole week writing notes. Do you know that the heart is very complicated? And you know, if you would like to look at my notes and maybe make some notes of your own. Oh, great idea. 
I could let you borrow my notebook. Uh, okay. I'm sure I can find some use for this in my line of work. In that case, you know what? You know what? You just keep it. You just keep it and you study it. And seriously, if you ever need to know anything else about the heart, don't hesitate to ask me. And you know what? In fact, I'll send you some resources. After that day, I decided if the heart surgery thing didn't work out, he could go down to Hollywood. <laughs> That's a very precious memory to all of us who work here at the church because Dr. Bailey was such a delight to work with and to have as part of our service. A second memory I have also took place here in this sanctuary, and it happened on more than one occasion. I was seated over there where my wife and I are sitting today. The sanctuary was filled with medical students and prospective students, and Dr. Bailey stood here at this pulpit and shared with them his story. I was struck because where I was sitting, I could look at the students and prospective students to get a sense of whether or not they were engaged, whether or not they were listening. Anyone who speaks soon learns that it takes a lot to engage students who are busy and who are stressed. And I was struck each time I heard him share his story, be real about some of his struggles. Be opened about moments in his life when things were uncertain. I was struck by his authenticity and his vulnerability. And I was also struck by how keenly those young people listened. And I remember thinking, here's a surgeon, an icon in the world into which they are headed, and he's sharing openly about his own struggles. What a gift. My third memory was receiving a package in the mail one day and opening it to find a book, a book written by Wayne Mueller entitled Sabbath, Finding Rest in a Hectic World. I looked at the note that was attached, a handwritten note, a handwritten note in which Dr. Bailey said, I just thought you might find this book of value. I've appreciated you, and I want you to know that, and I want you to use this if in any way it can be of help. I continue to treasure that book. In fact, I went back to the last time I preached on the topic and discovered that my notes are filled with quotes from the gift that Dr. Bailey gave to me. I want to share with you a scripture, a scripture from Paul's second letter to his friends at Corinth that at this particular moment in time probably didn't feel so much like friends. Because there were some there, a few of them there, who were questioning his authority as an apostle. Was he a legitimate apostle? Paul's world was accustomed to asking for letters of recommendation for those who traveled and spoke. Not having some of the advantages we have of quickly checking people out, they wanted to know, what are your letters? Uh, who is writing for you? Who can affirm that you are who you claim to be? So Paul is writing into that kind of a situation. And when he does, he writes these words, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to praise ourselves again, Paul asks? Are we like others who need to bring you letters of recommendation or who ask you to write such letters on their behalf? Surely not. The only letter of recommendation we need is you, yourselves. Your lives are a letter written in our hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you. Clearly, you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter, in quotation marks, is written not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. 
So Paul is speaking to any who might question him about the validity of his work, about the authenticity of his ministry, about whether or not he's a legitimate spokesperson for Christ. They're saying, where where are your letters? Where are your letters of recommendation? And Paul says to them, I'll tell you where they are. These different people that have come under my teaching, who have been part of my team, for whom I have given leadership and mentorship, my letter is their hearts. My letter is what's written in their hearts, not with pen and ink, but with the indelible power of the Spirit of God. That's my letter of recommendation. Just listen to that last line again. This letter is not written with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. As I read that, I thought of Dr. Bailey. I thought, what if someone were to ask Dr. Bailey about his work, about his legacy, whether or not his time was well spent, whether or not his life made a difference. I think the difference that was made will not be etched on a stone headstone, but it will be sutured into the hearts, stitched into the lives of so many infants and babies and children who live today because of him. Those are the kinds of letters of recommendation that can never be written here. They're written, as was true for Paul, on the human heart, on the human soul. Were we to be able to speak to Dr. Bailey today, we would be able to say to him, Dr. Bailey, your legacy is in the lives of people who live, whose destinies were changed, in the hearts of others who never had you operate on them, but who operated with you, who were your mentees, those of us who knew you from a bit further of a distance but still admired you. There is still that indelible inscribing of your life on our hearts. Just as truly as that was clear in the life of Paul, just so truly is it clear in the life of Leonard Bailey. There was another apostle who wrote about the heart. His name was John. He wrote about the heart in the last hours, reflecting on the last hours of Jesus' life. It was just hours away from the crucifixion. The disciples had hunkered together and huddled down around a rough-hewn table to celebrate the Passover meal. Jesus, they could tell, was different this night. They could sense something ominous in the near future. There was no doubt a great deal of fear and trouble and anxiety in the room. And it's what caused Jesus to speak, to say something that later John would inscribe with a quill pen on ancient parchment. But they're words that live on to this very day. For Jesus looked at his disciples and said to them, Let not your hearts. Let not your hearts. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there is much room. If that weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So regardless of what comes, Jesus is saying, 
regardless of what sorrow or anxiety or heaviness threatens, don't let your hearts be troubled. Your hearts belong to me. You're safe in the hand of God. So we gather here today recognizing that the legacy of Dr. Bailey's life has been sutured into many, many hearts. But we also gather here recognizing that the hope of our hearts has been extended to us by none other than Jesus himself. May his strength and his spirit and his grace comfort our hearts till we see him face to face. My, what stories <clears throat> that fill the tapestry telling of his life. It's not possible to tell all the important stories, <clears throat> but they're beautiful, what we do get to share. In the fall of 1984, in ensuing years, there was pride-inducing times for students of Loma Linda University. Our university, without a marquee of a football team, was in global and North American news. Newspapers, weekly magazines, network TV. At times, it was a frenzy. We saw it all as positive and watched with rapt attention. Dr. Bailey was an insightful pioneering hero. His team was world leading, a status that's lasted decades. His vision, dream, and actuation had materially enhanced the school's reputation to this day. I well remember my first conversation with him while a summer research student. It was 1983, before fame. A knock at his partially open door, a quiet turn from his bar stool height swivel chair that abutted a workstation more like an architect's an inquisitive look, and a conversation. In that brief encounter, elements of Dr. Bailey had been seen, artistry, a quiet, humble demeanor that you've heard about, kindness, and a sharing of expertise. Artistry, his office setup was simply one for an artist. What surgeon has an office like that? Watching and helping him operate in his prime was, was another artistic display. He would take a moment to size up the anatomic problem in his mind, translate that to a pat shape, and then elegantly set about creating a solution. And it might be different than what others would do. Soft hands, economy of motion, simplicity. It was a master artist rendition of a congenital repair. And if it was really tough, you know what he said, piece of cake. Gentle demeanor. There was definitely a gentle way and quiet voice. That was true even before cancer. In the OR, we called it mumbling. You might say the nursing and perfusion team had to learn to recognize patterns of a sound as opposed to words. On your own, man. Huh? Might mean, what's the blood gas? Or it might mean, cut your flow in half. And it was important stuff. Remarkably, this idiosyncrasy was more amusing than problematic. Kindness. Luca Vigella, now a noted congenital heart surgeon and formerly a visiting Italian medical student, puts it this way. What immediately struck me about Dr. Bailey was his amazingly down-to-earth welcoming personality. He was kind, human, and gentle. And it wasn't just to Luca, to nursing staff, and residents to patients and families. Sharing of expertise. My next conversation with Dr. Bailey initiated what became a long mentor-mentee relationship that went from goats and lambs to academics to creating a congenital heart surgeon, and yes, teaching complex transplantation. 
I spotted him walking away from a fetting at graduation. Cap and gown coming off, Nancy at his side, I pounced. Dr. Bailey, I'm a surgery resident and have some elective time. Can I work with you? Nancy beamed. Dr. Bailey, perhaps taken aback by the ambush, caught his surprise and then warmly embraced the concept. Yes. He similarly took many under his guidance. I can't possibly reflect their stories in this brief time. You had to earn it. And he would set the bar for performance, but he took many in. And he was incredibly generous with helping his trainees do cases. How does 29, day, 29 cases in 11 operating days sound on an overseas heart trip to Nepal? And I could tell you, and I probably should tell you, that trip, I wasn't significant. It was who he identified to become the heart surgeon for Nepal. Today, they're doing thousands, they've done thousands and thousands of cases because of the work he and Nancy did and Joan Coggin while we were there. Once, as a little aside, Dr. Bailey was helping me bust through a pediatric case, at least so I thought. After a while, out came this snarky growl. You gonna stand there and admire it, or you gonna operate? There was no mumbling. To this day, it is my all-time favorite surgical one-liner. Of course, there were innumerable thoughtful moments of teaching about surgery and life. His students and advice seekers came from around the globe. Names like Joe, Nori, Waldo, Francois, Javier. Marcelletti would call from Rome for transplant advice. Kirk Cantor from Atlanta tells of Dr. Bailey being so generous. Here's our transplant protocol book. You can have it. And he created the environment and space for stars at home, Joyce Johnston, Richard Chinnick, Anise Razouk, amongst others. All of Dr. Bailey's students wanted to not just emulate, but to embody him. Despite some rising to substantial stature at major institutions such as the Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Toronto, and others, each is left reaching. Dr. Bailey continues to be the North Star. I wonder if those who trained with him or with his students would please stand. Nobody talks about leading with love but Dr. Bailey did. Books on management and leadership are entitled Good to Great, The One Minute Manager, Team of Teams. Had Dr. Bailey written a book, it might have been titled Leading with Love, How Love Helps Your Team Reach Its Potential. I'll reflect Dr. Bailey's words from one of our last conversations. We love you, Dr. Bailey. Always have, always will.
It is rare in the life of any organization that a single event, particularly in an organization over 100 years old like Loma Linda, that a single event can change its trajectory forever. And yet in the fall of 1984, with what came to be known simply as Baby Faye, Dr. Leonard Bailey did that for Loma Linda. And in the subsequent years, he became an icon both on this campus and around the world as he freely shared his knowledge and techniques with other surgical centers. In time, that launched a spate of infant heart transplant programs throughout the world. Just a few months ago in March, Len and Nancy had a chance to say goodbye to Len's graduating class of 1969 from Moat Medicine here at Loma Linda, celebrating the 50th anniversary. And now we say goodbye to both Len and Nancy. Thank you for what you've done at this place. Thank you for the legacy that you have given us that will long be remembered and cherished. been quite a trip. Len, I'm writing this to you. In 1984, on a consortium to China, I met Dr. Ralph Harris, who was at that time on the um, internal review board. He asked my opinion concerning xenotransplantation. Since I was really enthusiastic about the probability that someday it would be an option, the IRB invited me here to review and advise about your proposition to save a newborn babies, to save newborn babies dying from underdeveloped hearts. Soon we were collaborating on the immunological research required by the IRB for making its final decision. Three months later, I had just finished that research when you called me to ask if I had finished the research and would recommend to the IRB to proceed with a clinical case. Gulp. I said, yes. You said, great because I have a baby and six baboons and you have to come out to California. <laughs> Len, the world recognizes your great contribution to the field of infant heart transplantation, the savior of otherwise doomed babies. But the true greatness of you can be recognized only by those closest to you. The miracle of Stephanie Fay was you and God working together. I knew it was a miracle in the making. For six days while I matched baby Fay to her donors, you and God struggled to keep her alive successfully. At 6 a.m. the morning of her salutary surgery, you went to chapel to pray for God's help to save Stephanie's life and for confirmation of your concept to transplant a newborn's heart. In your words, it's just a muscle, Sandy. And Dr. Waldo Concepcion and I went for a walk following a night of rain. When we turned around to head back to the hospital and the OR, there was God's message. A rainbow embracing our hospital. It was then that I realized two things. God was promising you and our institution that you would succeed in this endeavor and that the previous six days of matching Stephanie against her potential donors had miraculously brought us to the seventh day for Stephanie's world-renowned transplant. 
Dr. Brian Bull, our chief of pathology, shared with me one day that looking at a specimen coming from a surgery of yours was like seeing that God had been there. On this day, I believe that the significance of the spelling of your name says you were full of unconditional love, humility, and single-mindedness about your dream. At this time, I would like to tell you how I see you. Leonard, loving beyond most of our understanding, enterprising, original, noble, accomplished, a researcher, and decisive. Lee, love, more love. Envoy, our father's messenger, as to teaching us how to be his follower and teacher. Exceptional. Bailey, bigger than all of us together because of your humbleness. Abundance of heart. Industrious. Love, even more love. Established that otherwise unsalvageable, ba unsalvageable babies could live normal lives. And you, Leonard Lee Bailey, you were our Len. But now, Len, you are with your beloved angel, Nancy, and Jesus, our Savior, and Father, our God, and God, our Father. We love you, Len. We all would like to thank you for attending this memorable and loving memorial to Dr. Leonard Lee Bailey. Thank you. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we thank you for the demonstration of your love in the life of our dear colleague and friend. The legacy of his loving service to your children has been far-reaching and will continue to impact those of us who served with him here and also those around the world. We pray for comfort for his family, especially considering the recent loss of Nancy as well and for as many friends who mourn his loss, but may we also experience your spirit in this time of grief and know joy remembering a life well lived. As we leave this place, help us to embody Dr. Bailey's love, compassion, optimism, determination, creativity, and generosity as we carry on his mission of service for you. In thy name, amen. On behalf of Dr. Bailey's family, we thank you for coming and sharing this most meaningful time with us. We'd like to ask if you would be kind enough to remain seated, giving the family an opportunity to exit. And then at the end of the postlude, you are welcome to stay and linger and share stories, talk with one another, extend comfort, and just know that your presence here has been deeply appreciated. When you exit through the lobby, you will see that if you missed the guest register on the way in, it will still be there and your signature would be appreciated. There are also cards on which you can write memories or messages. Thank you very much. <laughs>